All right, folks, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered for Monday, March 25th, 2019. No, we are not leading with the Mueller report. Why? Nobody has read it. We're leading with Florida, where the Republicans in Florida are trying to screw the formerly incarcerated out of the right to vote. Uh, a Senate committee has voted to essentially slap a poll tax on all those formerly incarcerated, saying pay back all your fines and court costs before you can vote. That is not what the voters voted on. I told y'all Republicans were going to screw around with the right to vote. It was not going to be simple. We'll explain to you. Another cop acquitted on charges of shooting and killing a young black man, this time in Pittsburgh. Students today took to the streets to protest what, what took place. We'll talk with Rob Taylor, magic editor of the New Pittsburgh Courier, the new black newspaper there. Uh, he covered the trial. Also, a tragic end to the story of Columbus, Ohio activist Amber Evans. Her body was found over the weekend after being missing since January 28th. We'll talk to psychologist Dr. Jeffrey Gardier on the emotional toll on activists. We've seen a number of other activists across the country take their lives. We'll talk about that with Jeff Gardier. Trump's Attorney General Bob Barr sends a four-page letter to Congress with his own summary of the Mueller report. No one has actually read the Mueller report except the folks in the Department of Justice. So why are people assuming Mueller reported one thing when we actually don't know that? Trump is claiming total exoneration. Not so fast. We've got three lawyers to break it down. Stacey Abrams starts a new organization to get an honest count of people in the shadows of the 2020 census. That's needed because the Trump administration is trying their best to scare away Hispanic and other immigrants. Folks, nearly a trillion dollars in federal spending hangs in the balance. And some ignorant flat bo frat boys playing at slavery. Mm -hmm. Get what you see the shocking video. More crazy as white boys. A new photograph of Harriet Tubman unveiled today at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We live streamed it and we'll show you that photo as well. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is. November by 65% voters in Florida said give the folks who are formerly incarcerated the right to vote. It passed overwhelmingly Republicans and Democrats. But I told y'all, I kept warning y'all, don't think for a second Florida Republicans are going to allow this to happen. They do not want to see upwards of 1.4 million people getting their right to vote. Well, today, a Senate subcommittee passed by three to two, uh, uh, a bill that would force those individuals to pay back all court costs and court fines before they got the right to vote. The same bill, uh, actually another bill, passed the House 10 to 5. The Senate bill is even worse than the House bill. This is a video put out by the group that actually fought, uh, fought the effort to get for Florida folks their right to vote uh, back. This is what they released today on social media. Amendment 4 changed everything for those of us on these steps. Last year we were here without a voice. This year we're here with a voice. And people want to know, hey, what are y'all doing while you're here? It's simple. The completion of sentence is an issue that's being debated, and we know that the standard already exists. And if there's a move to go beyond that, that is an unconstitutional move, and we will advocate against that. We don't just say we want more, we say we demand more. We have a vote, and that vote is our voice. Last year, many years before that, we went to individuals and said, your voice is my vote, because I can't vote. Today we say, our vote is our voice. 
as we go into our meetings today, as we see our elected officials, we're going to remind them not just why we're fighting, but who we're fighting for, for our families, for our children, for our communities. And we're going to remind them that they should be fighting for them too. As we go and meet with them, we will tell them that failure to eliminate the barriers that limit us impact the communities they serve. And if they fail to re represent the communities they serve, we will find someone else who will. Well, folks, that's actually what's going to happen. Uh, Andrew Gillum, of course, who lost his bid for governor of Florida, this is what he had to say uh, today in a statement that was released. The legislation advanced today in committee in the Florida Senate puts a price on restoring the right to vote. It is unconstitutional and it is wrong. Last year, Floridians overwhelmingly passed the largest expansion of the right to vote since the Voting Rights Act. I am proud, I am proud Floridians stood together and agreed we would not judge each other by our worst day. And yes, we knew exactly what we were voting for. To those lawmakers who are advancing this misguided bill, you may not respect the wishes of the people, but this is a democracy and you must follow them. We, the people, People will make sure of it. Uh, also, of course, uh, the Florida uh, Democratic Party, they're also weighing in. Uh, just a few moments ago, uh, they released a uh, statement, uh, and this I'm going to pull it up here. Uh, it says, uh, today, Florida Democratic uh, Party Chair Terry Rizzo released this statement. Today, Republicans in the state Senate voted to overturn the will of the people and violate the constitutional rights of returning citizens. This bill is an unconstitutional poll tax that recalls the darkest moments of our state's history. And let's not forget that the roots of today's crisis lie with Governor Ron DeSantis' refusal in December to implement Amendment 4. Joining us right now uh, is uh, someone who's been very involved uh, in this. Uh, he's been focused on it. Neil Volz, the Florida Restoration uh, Commission, uh, their policy director. Neil, welcome to Roland Martin Unfiltered. Hey, thanks, Roland, for having us. Uh, I never trusted the Republicans. I knew this was going to happen. Uh, and so what you have, so explain exactly uh, so what happened in the Senate, because uh, I was texting uh, Sheena and Desmond earlier, and they say that the Senate bill is worse than the House bill. Yeah, I mean, what, what you've got are two different bills that have problems all over the place. And, you know, and, and, and there were moments that you, you thought possibly some amendment that had been offered by uh, you know, Senator Bracey is a Democrat from Orlando, great guy, that maybe, just maybe, we'd see, you know, some, some, some semblance of uh, bipartisanship, and, and it didn't happen again. And it just saddens me, man, uh, thinking about all the lives impacted by these policies and the fact that uh, we just can't move forward in a way that uh, the people spoke in November, which was based around unity and the restoration and second chances and something that we all could get behind. And now it's turning into this partisan food fight. Uh, and again, uh, you're talking about uh, the numbers here, and they're trying to use your own words against you. They're trying to say that in the Supreme Court uh, that the Florida Restoration Commission, that uh, you guys said that uh, paying back fines could be a part of this. So explain that. Yeah, I mean, what they're basically doing is playing word games, Roland. Uh, it was very clear in the in, before the court that uh, uh, the general counsel was talking about a sentence given by a judge, right? And 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 and, and the judge it guides these these processes, right? We all know that in Florida, you can get all kinds of fines, you can get court costs that the judge didn't even give you, and so they're trying to say take some things out of context to basically say that, uh, you know, oh, we were making blanket statements about all fines, blanket statements about all costs, when clearly we were talking about uh, costs associated with uh, what the judge gave in terms of the sentence. Now, we talk about... We um, so talk th maybe we could have been more clear. Let, let me just actually, we're a second chances campaign. We don't believe that we're perfect. So let me even come on air and say, maybe we could have been clearer. Um, but, but, but they're missing the point. You know, this is about uh, expanding democracy and allowing people to become part of their communities. It's, it's not just some sort of political science exercise. Uh, last question for you. Uh, what is next? Obviously, it goes to the uh, full Senate. Is that correct? Or it, go, it then goes to the full House? Uh, has DeSantis said that he's going to sign this if it passes the House and the Senate? Uh, he has. He has not uh, weighed in on any specifics uh, yet. Um, there, there are a variety of different committees that it still needs to work through in, in, in both the House and the Senate. Um, so we had dozens of returning citizens, people with past felony convictions from all over the state, present 
today, and we're just going to keep that pressure on. We're going to keep uh, sharing stories and talking about uh, why this really gets to the heart of democracy in the state of Florida. Well, all right, then, we well, certainly appreciate it. Uh, Neil Votes, thanks a lot. I want to right now introduce my hey, panel. Thanks. Thank you, Robert Patillo, of course. He's a civil rights attorney. Also, uh, we have, of course, Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president of the Bennett College, Michael Brown, former vice chair, DNC. Robert, I'll start with you again. Republicans were not going to just stand pat and see 1.4 million people added to the voter registration rolls, knowing full well that could imperil their supermajority in the legislature and also impact 2020 and Donald Trump. Uh, and, you know, and, and Desmond and Sheena Mead, who fought for this, I said, look, don't think for a second, if this is just because it passes, they're going to take it lying down. They, what, this, what they're trying to do here is do something that the voters did not spe specify. Mm -hmm. Let's understand one thing. This issue has to be federalized. I think we, what we have seen is fighting this on the state level, state by state, is like playing a game of whack-a-mole. As soon as you uh, think you've taken out one part, then you revert back to the old. Well, but it can be federalized because well, the reality is uh, the states have said mm -hmm. since the Constitution was put in place that, that voting is a state issue, not a federal issue. Uh, hold, hold on. The reason it has to be federalized because the basis of felony disenfranchisement in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which uh, reads participation in a rebellion or other crimes. Other crimes was interpreted by the Supreme Court in 1974 in the Ramirez decision to be felonies, um, upholding felony disenfranchisement. If, we, if we're talking about lowering the voting age, we're talking about abolishing the Electoral College, we have to talk about taking out our other crimes from Section 2 of the 14th Amendment and you eliminate felony disenfranchisement from the, old con uh, the entire country. The entire concept behind the or other crimes was if you fought in the Civil War for the South, you don't get to uh, vote. That was the original intent of the drafters of the 14th Amendment, and that has never been addressed by any political party to fix a typo, which has stopped tens of millions of black folks from voting for the last century, or century and a half. So that's something, as we're going to this 2020 rubric and figuring out what the platform's going to be, that has to be part of what we're discussing. We're talking about all these other uh, high-minded issues. Eliminating three words could put millions of people back on the voter rolls as soon as it's done. But the problem, Julian, you've got a conservative Supreme Court you got uh, Trump trying to put as many federal judges on the bench as possible. Uh, that's not what they want to see. And what you have consistently seen here uh, are Republicans who are trying their best to, frankly, shrink the number of yeah. voters. And again, they do not want to see 1.4 million people add to the voting rolls in Florida because that totally changes the battleground state of Florida in 2020. As Frederick Douglass said, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Those who want freedom without agitation want the ocean without its mighty roar. What the um, Sheena and her husband did is they changed basically the equation. What the Florida Republicans are doing is trying to take about power can seize nothing without a demand. What needs to happen, I, just, I, I think the federalizing issue is could be an issue, but I think we have to look at the state of Florida, a swing state, a state that we will see all kind of chicanery right. with voting. We have to look at this, and we have to really look at um, basically the pushback. You were right when you basically said, y'all don't get too complacent, because everybody was celebrating, clapping. Right. We you've got 1.4 million more people. Well, these 1.4 million are going to be basically sliced and diced with this legislature, and this has to be... Um, you know, fought. Michael, what's even more more shameful, this was a change to the state constitution. And so what they thought was, we changed the state constitution, and then that's the victory. Legislature is coming back and doing exactly what Republicans have done in other states. Voters vote one way, legislature says, you know what, the hell with y'all, we're going to change it. I remember that episode, Roland, when, when you and I talked about that it wasn't going to be this easy. It was great that it obviously had passed on the referendum. But uh, this is still, yes, there's a leak. Clearly, there's a legal argument. Obviously, I followed the Constitution. I get it. But it's also political messaging. And there's still more white returning citizens in Florida than there are black. Right. But it's making it seem like this is a black thing. And whenever you got to make it seem like a black thing, folks in the panhandle. Oh, yeah. So it's a whole, Florida is not just South Beach, Miami. It's a whole another rural part of the state. So you see all these black folks. Oh, these are the folks who are going to be voting. And it's racial messaging, political messaging, and that's kind of what we're doing. And this is why when it comes to voting, I, I, at Congressional Black Caucus last year, it was a panel of all these civil rights organizations, and I said on voting, I said, y'all have got to stop making this a black thing. I said, because you got to say to these young white voters, and to these elderly white voters, and to these white folks who have gone to prison who can't vote to, as well, and this is screwing you. 
because the reality is that's also targeting them. When you had a clerk in Wisconsin who said after in 2016 she removed an early voting location from a college campus because too many of them voted Democrat and she moved it to a far out place with a small parking lot was by design. That mm -hmm. impacted white folks. Moving early voting locations off of college campuses in North Carolina affected white students. And so to Michael's point, we'd love to see some of those people who are white who are formerly incarcerated stand up and go to the legislature and say, damn it, y'all trying to screw us. And so we'll keep y'all updated on exactly what happens uh, with this story. Now, another story that we had we were focusing on, keeping you updated, uh, has a very tragic and sad end. That is Amber Evans, the young Columbus, Ohio activist who went missing on January 28th. Remember, her car was found just outside uh, on the banks of a river there in Ohio. Well, over the weekend, her body was recovered from that particular river, and it was identified as 28-year-old Amber Evans. The police have not released any information regarding the cause of death, Evans' boyfriend of 10 years, who has been cooperating with police, said they argued that day there were no reports of any domestic violence in that relationship. Now, we do not know why or how Amber Evans died, but we do know that being a committed activist, as she uh, was, can take a big emotional toll. Now, her mother released a video uh, this weekend on Facebook uh, when uh, that information uh, came out. And so we could actually play that video uh, of her mother. It was really sad to see her actually release that video. Here's what her mom had to say. All right, so um, in a sec, so what we'll do is, folks, we'll, we'll try to pull that video up. It was really uh, a troubling video, uh, and it was a sad video as well. And, and the reason this story uh, is, is so hard is because uh, previously in Ohio, there was a black activist who took his own life. Uh, we've seen stories out of Ferguson where a variety of African Americans uh, have actually been shot and killed, some who also took their own life uh, as well. Uh, there are other stories uh, that we've been reading about. Ashley Yates, a prominent activist who was in Ferguson, who's now moved to the Bay Area, she's talked openly on social media about being an activist and how uh, it has been such a, a traumatic and emotional toll on her as well. Uh, so they're telling me we all have the video of the mother. Here we go. I just want to go on Facebook and let you guys know that we find it so, so disrespectful that people are trying to capitalize and get recognition off of the news that we just heard about my daughter. It's a shame that you guys can't even give us a moment to just take it in, just to breathe. I'm getting phone calls after phone calls, and I understand people are concerned. I understand that people care. I understand that people want to let us know that how they feel. But what about how we feel at this moment? I hear that Channel 10, 6, and 4 have all gone on to tell you guys that yes, my baby's gone, and it is true. So what are we supposed to do with that at this moment? Is we're supposed to gather with our family, with my children. Even though I asked social media not to be blasted with stuff to give us time, I asked the media to give us time, but yet, and I even got a call from Channel 10 asking me how I felt about them airing it and they still went on and did it anyways. I asked for just a moment of time to ourselves so that my family could be able to all find out, so that my family could be able to take that moment to just come together and, and love and friends to come by and family to come by and just to sit and be with each other, but no. Everybody still wants to do it. I want to go to our panel here. Um, Dr. King, when he when he was assassinated, doctors said that his heart literally was that of a man almost 70 years old. Uh, I cannot remember her name right now. Uh, she was the white mother who was protesting the war. Uh, and it was like three straight years uh, during George W. Bush's presidency. And then she said, you know what, I got to step away from this. The average person out there, we're watching these activists and we're seeing them and, and, and we're seeing them 
uh, at news conferences and at rallies and leading protests, not understanding what's happening behind that. Yeah. The number of individuals uh, in Black Lives Matter who've talked about uh, sleeping on the couches, losing their apartments, uh, the health issues they have, the trauma, the PTSD, uh, having to deal with uh, another case, being triggered by videos. Uh, and, 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 and so we don't necessarily understand how major this is and, the, and how impactful it is on the lives of the individuals who are fighting these issues. Roland, you know, the stress, stress will kill you. Simple stress will kill you. These folks are under enormous stress. And they're young people who are making a difference, but they're making a difference often without being affirmed. Many of them don't have full-time jobs. How do they live? I mean, they talk, you know, the couch surfing, you know, they're going from city to city. You know, you talk to some of them. Their commitment is unassailable, but the stress is also uh, inexplicable. And I think that there's not enough empathy for them and not enough empathy for the ways that they live. Um, we saw with the, um, re after the Parkland, two young right. people. Right. Now we have uh, two, two partners who have committed suicide. There also were students at the Columbine who survived who also committed suicide as well. And this is a combination. And, and, of course, and then today, at a town hall in Connecticut, uh, the father, one of the Sandy Hook uh, children, he committed suicide at the town hall. And, you know, the, again, we're not dealing with the stress, right. of what these people have to, have to deal with. And, and, and I, as I said, stress will kill you. These are very young people who have not fully formed their identities, wanna, wanna and they're, pull, but they're stepping up. I want to pull in Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, uh, who joins us right now. So, Dr. Gardier, a lot of these activists young folks who, who saw an issue, they want to get involved. Then all of a sudden, it, it continues and it continues and all, they look up and it's a year or two or three years later, then all of a sudden, it comes crashing down on them. I remember reading Harry Belafonte's uh, autobiography, his memoir, where he talked about uh, sending John Lewis and Fannie Lou Hamer and some other activists uh, to an African country on vacation because they need to get away. And for a lot of people, we don't think about the need for activists to get away because of how stressful and difficult this work is. That's right, because it's not just about uh, being able to get a message out there. Uh, in many ways, maybe their catharsis, especially when we're looking at uh, the uh, youngsters involved in Parkland, um, that massacre. Um, but once they are out there, uh, they're up against not just getting a message, uh, out there. They're up against um, trolls, internet trolls. They're up against uh, politicians who are dead set against what it is that they're doing. Um, they're up against populations of people who see them as enemies. Uh, they're mm -hmm. up against conspiracy theorists. So the, the stress and the pressure, uh, as Julianne Malvo has, has said, is just absolutely enormous. At the end of the day, these are still children. And I think many of us fooled ourselves into thinking, ah, we got the formula. The formula is if they've been through one of these shootings and they become activists, that will do it. But that can add on a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, and they still need to get that therapy. They still need to be treated therapeutically. And we have to stop treating them as adults. They are still children, even though they are doing some amazing things so, out so, there. So, Doc, what do we do? So what, what systems should be in place? Uh, because, again, when we talk about the civil rights movement, the black freedom movement, uh, the, the reality is if you look at most conversations, you don't have discussions about self-care. They were just mm -hmm. figuring out as they went along. Uh, now it's a whole different set of issues. Now you also have individuals who are attacking activists on social media. They, they are going after them in many ways. Some of them have been sued by municipalities as well. And so it's a whole different uh, set uh, of issues that they're not dealing with. And so, uh, you know, what system should be in place for them? Because unfortunately, and this is the one of the things I kept saying to Black Lives Matter activists, when you don't have organizational infrastructure to provide those things, you're sort of out there along winging it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first things um, I think a lot of the uh, activists need to learn about rules of engagement. Um, what are the things that they need to avoid? Where do they find their strength? 
Um, I think that's very important. You put the other part together, Roland. It is about the self-care. When do we take a break and be able to rest? When do we rest our souls and our minds? And another thing that we need is, of course, being able to debrief. What does it feel like to be uh, that activist? What does it feel like to be attacked all the time? What does it feel like to do impossible work? So that needs to be discussed. It's part of a therapy, but it's part of a catharsis, and it's part of sharing. Well, and you can't be a hero and shiro just by yourself. It has to be the community. And last question for you. Uh, what should also uh, be taking place in terms of from one activist to the other? Uh, because, again, we've seen a number across the country. Uh, I know of a gentleman who was in Ohio uh, who shot himself and some other places as well where they've taken their own lives because they literally you know, just cannot handle seeing and being involved with case after case after case of uh, black men and black women being gunned down uh, by cops and show what discussions should be being held among activists themselves. What should they be looking for amongst their fellow activists? Uh, they should have some sort of a bond. Uh, whether they agree or disagree with whatever the other activists may be doing, if it's competing organizations, there should be that family uh, where we can talk to one another, where we can share those strategies, where we can do what I just talked about, uh, debriefing. Because at the end of the day, it is a very select club, whether they're competing against one another or not for the message, but they are brothers and sisters in arms. They're in it together. All right. Dr. Jeff Gardier, we appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure, Roland. All right, folks. Speaking of activism, today in Pittsburgh, students took to the streets to protest uh, the not guilty verdict of East Pittsburgh police officer Michael Roosevelt. Uh, he was charged with criminal homicide. His trial ended on Friday. Again, he was found not guilty in the shooting death of Antoine Rose, an African-American uh, who was stopped in June of 2018. He was running away after the car he was in was stopped by police who were investigating a drive-by shooting. Rose was shot in the black, excuse me, in the back Folks, uh, this is video uh, of that, and it's quite disturbing, so we just want to warn you in advance. This is video of that shooting. Why are they shooting at him? No, I'm recording this. Why are they shooting? They All they did was run, and they're shooting at them. You go in the house. Don't shoot at them. Antoine Rose, again, was 17 years old. Joining us is Rob Taylor, managing editor of the New Pittsburgh Courier, a black newspaper there. He covered the story. Uh, Rob, the jury found this officer not guilty. What was the rationale that, what, he feared for his life? Uh, I mean, Rose was running away. Well, nice to be on your show, Roland. I think uh, Roosevelt, he testified on the third day of the trial. So the trial which you know, all of us here in Pittsburgh have been anticipating for months ever since the incident happened in mid-June. So the trial began on March 19th. He testified, not many people knew that he was gonna take the stand. So he testified on uh, Thursday, March 21st. And he, he went up there and said that he thought, and as I see it here, I thought that one of them was pointing a weapon <laughs> at me. And I quote again, I thought one of them was pointing a weapon at me. So. What happened there, as you may have seen in the video, there were three men in the car. Right. A man who was, uh, you know, a jitney, which, you know, uh, Uber, so, you know, so to speak, you know, take people around who need to get where they need to go. Who knows if the driver knew that there was going to be a drive-by shooting about to happen. The man in the back, uh, I don't think you've shown the video yet, but the man in the back, Zywan Hester, fired nine shots out of the back window of the Chevrolet Cruze 15 minutes before Rossville uh, pulled over this cruise. So Antoine Rose was in the front right passenger seat. He did not fire any guns. He was unarmed when you saw him running. So in Rossville's defense, he's saying, you know, when he had the first man, the driver, he ordered him out of the vehicle towards the ground. Rossville is testifying that he was focused on the man who was down. He turns thought that he saw Rose and or Hester pointing a handgun, turns, and he says here, as I look at what he put, 
One of the suspects turned, pointed toward me with what I thought was a handgun. After thinking, I thought I saw a handgun, he says, I turn and fire three rounds. And he also said that he did it to protect himself and the community. A guy who was running away from him. A guy uh, who you saw in the video running away. Uh, first of all, was, was there any body cam footage from the officers? To my knowledge, nothing. We have not seen any body cam footage. Uh, actually, you know, East Pittsburgh is where uh, Ross fell. He was just, I think it was, I think it was his first day <laughs> on the force. East Pittsburgh is a very small suburban community. It's uh, the, the place of the original drive-by shooting was in North Braddock, which is just a few minutes from East Pittsburgh. They're neighboring uh, suburban small towns. And we never saw any body cam footage. The East Pittsburgh Police Department, which I believe had about eight part-time officers or something like that, they disbanded, so they are no more. So uh, there's been a lot of complaints about did the East Pittsburgh Police Department provide proper training? Uh, why didn't he wait for backup? Backup was actually coming at the time when he fired the, 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 the shots. So there's been a lot of uh, debate about this actual police department. Got it. And if they trained him properly. Well, it's, it's, well, first of all, it's not stunning that you would see him say that uh, he feared for his life. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we know so many other cases where officers fire guns at people who are running away, uh, which still makes no sense because they're running away. And so how, how your life is in danger. We saw those students protesting today. Do we expect right. continuing protests to take place there in Pittsburgh? Well, as I said, as you said earlier today, it was a majority high school students, uh, our Pittsburgh public school system, they put out uh, an email to all the media and everybody saying, you know, uh, you know, if you get a excused absence from your parents, you can go down there, whether they got them or not, who knows? The point was there were 1500 people, vast majority high school students, college students, Duquesne university, university law students. who I saw there as well, marched through the streets of downtown Pittsburgh, obviously disappointed, vehemently denying or not wanting to believe right. that, that this verdict could come. All right, then, uh, well, Rob, we still appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. No problem. All right, folks. Uh, again, so our panel real quick. Look, this is, like, this is, I'm not saying that body cams we would somehow have convicted the police officer, but having body cam footage, you would have been able to see if someone turned to him with a gun and if that even existed. This is still why, and I get, it's not a panacea, but that's why I don't care. And all these departments now trying to stop it. Every police department should have body cameras. Well, this is one of those places me and you have agreed on for years, which is that we have to have, going back to the same point, federalized standards, where the federal government needs to put out, if you're going to be a law enforcement officer in America, you have to be equipped with uh, a certain amount of training. You have to be equipped with a body camera. You have to be equipped with the, uh, the equipment you need to not have to murder people if you think you're a little bit scared. And, we and if you turn it off, automatic expulsion. Absolutely. Precisely. You know, the, that's the, my problem. They'll turn it off. You got the, the video of the brother running, the young man running. Right. And so you didn't see him turn around. This guy said he saw right. somebody turn around. You didn't see him turn around. Uh, the training piece is the biggest piece here. He was on his first day or something, and he just feels like he was, um, you know, at risk. But, Roland, they had the uh, the foreman of this jury was African-American man, an older African-American man, retired. Um, I don't want to call the man Uncle Tom. <laughs> but, but I would like to say... You just did. Yeah. No, I said I didn't want to. Oh, no, but what's the basis? <laughs> what? He what's was the basis? Of me calling him Uncle Tom? Yes. Uh, doing his Mr. Bojangles thing on camera. Talking oh, no, about what did he say? He said, what, what, what would you do without the police? We need the police. So you have to give the police the benefit of the doubt because we need the police. He went on to say he knew the community was going to be upset, but you need the police. He said also because... Well, first of all, man, I can agree with all of that, but still say... Damn it, you're wrong for firing shots at somebody no, running away. He, well, obviously, he didn't. Okay, no, he I got it. He felt that the firing of the shots was okay because he believed that the policeman was in fear of his life. He also said because the other two did not testify, one took the fifth, the other, because the other two did not testify, he felt the jury had no choice. But they did have a choice. Okay, that is nuts. Michael, real quick, go ahead. You know, I think the larger issue in this, it's trying to balance between... It sounds like what the foreman said about about what the community is policing clearly is also the standard in the courtroom 
the laws have to change relative right. to how you convict police officers. It is they they have a, they have a hook to hang their hat on pretty much every time. Every and, time. And oh, and life is, in danger. I'm okay. In danger. I'm afraid that's for it. my You're good. Life. You're good. Correct. I mean that, that's what it is. Running, but I'm that's what it, for my right. life. That's what it is. Yeah. Real, real quick. Real quick. Well, just tying this in with the last story about activists and, and the suicide rate, we have to teach these young people in the streets how to take that into city council, into the state legislature, get laws changed, because often what depresses you when you feel like nothing is happening, right. nothing has changed, does teach them how to make a real change. Well, also, real quick here for us, breaking news, go to my uh, iPhone, please. Uh, this is from TMZ, Big W over DeRay McKesson. Uh, this is Janine Pirro on Fox News. Uh, of course, DeRay McKesson sued Janine Pirro in a defamation lawsuit. She said on the air... Uh, that he was to blame for the violence during a Baton Rouge uh, protest. Uh, the judge ruled that she could not be, she could not defame him because her comments were protected by the First Amendment. Uh, mm. This judge, the quote, the judge didn't exactly paint a flattering picture of P. Rose commentary saying, P. Rose's lack of temperament and caustic commentary is what she is known, celebrated, and frequently criticized for. He added, while the court might not agree with or condone her behavior or rhetoric, the law protects her expression of opinion. And so that was a defamation suit uh, tossed out of court. DeRay McKesson filed against Fox News and Janine Pirro. Going to break when we come back. We're going to talk about the Barr report, not the Mueller report, because we haven't seen it or read it. That's next. Roller Martin Unfiltered. Mm -hmm. You either going to help run it or they're going to run it for you. In order to get anything done in this world, we have to work with the system that's there. And you have to have the courage of your predictions. You may despise me, you may not understand my choice, but at least you can respect that I stood in it. If you are outside the mainstream, no one can push you aside any further. Life makes you jaded and it hurts you. And it's painful. And we've had a lot of pain in this country. Trump can show up and say anything and they can just go, oh yeah. The African American community was great to us. They didn't vote. You know, he just called you stupid. Did you hear that? Oh, 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 but he's for us. Really? And they were just regurgitating the things that they had heard on a radio or in the barbershop or something that somebody had told them. They hadn't thought about it. Democracy is. Uh, in danger is because people don't know how to think. I'm done with trying to convince people to try to vote for their, you know, for their, for their life. You have to run for your life. I'm going to go try to get people who are open to it and, and, and lead them. I'm done with hope. Fuck hope. Bye. That's the good news. Check out Roller Bart Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. And check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Bart Unfiltered. Press play. The Eric Alexander interview will be at 7 p.m. Eastern on this Friday. Uh, all right, folks, let's talk about the Bob Barr report. Okay, Robert Mueller gave uh, the Attorney General his report uh, on Russian pot potential Russian interference in the election on Friday. Bob Barr released a four-page letter to Congress uh, on yesterday. Also, him decided that it was an obstruction of justice. All of these commentators have been talking about uh, the Mueller report, uh, how long it is, and how it exonerated uh, Donald Trump, the White House. They are uh, all excited. Uh, it was supposed to be about, of course, whether or not Trump or members of his campaign conspired with the Russian government in the 2016 election. Now, Bob Barr says, Mueller says that they, they found none of that. And also, what's up with the obstruction of justice? Barr concluded that was no obstruction of justice. Now, no criminal charges, but no exoneration either this morning on the Tom Jordan Morning Show. I talked with A. Scott Bolden and Monique Presley about this very issue, and I asked Scott about Donald Trump's victory lap. Yeah, really. You know, uh, think about it. An American president is running a victory lap because he wasn't indicted or he wasn't charged, and he wasn't found by his own Republican Party to have done anything wrong. I mean, let that settle for a minute. Secondly, uh, it wouldn't be a victory part. This is not the, the end of the investigation. In many respects, it's the beginning because, one, that 800-page report is going to have to come out. You're going to have to give the people what they want. But Congress is going to pursue it with vengeance, if you will, because bad conduct, unsavory conduct uh, may not rise to a level of criminality, but it certainly can rise to the, uh, to the impeachment process. And so look for more from this. Uh, but we got to get the report because the facts behind the decision of Barr and Mueller is uh, is really, really super important. I mean, the attack on our democracy, it goes to the core of our election and independent elections and values. And so uh, there's going to be more over this over the next two years. Trust me. 
uh, Monique, collusion. Uh, uh, Preet Bahara, the former U.S. attorney there in New York, he said on Good Morning America, on collusion, the case is closed. On the issue of, of obstruction, we're sort of not done. Uh, Mueller did not really, based upon what we know, again, Barr's interpretation, Four pages Mueller did not, make, did not take a side. No, he didn't. And and in in my mind and in my experience, that adds credibility to Mueller's report. It doesn't take from it because what you want is a special prosecutor that is going to look at facts and give you exactly what has been found and not overreach. Now, what the United States Congress does with those facts is up to them in doing their due diligence. He did the part that he was supposed to do with the information that he had. And I think once we see the 800 pages, we'll figure out that everybody with the last name Trump still has some problems. So because we can't find collusion somewhere in the code based on these facts, doesn't mean one, that the president didn't obstruct. We know he did. He said so on national television. And two, it doesn't mean that Congress doesn't still do their job. Right. And then we wait for the Southern District of New York to do its job. We're working hand in hand. Mueller found things that weren't part of his purview Mm -hmm. and passed them and referred them on to the Southern District. The Southern District picked them up, investigated them, and now they're starting to bring charges. So Mm -hmm. we're not near a conclusion. Hey, guys, let's remember one other thing, too. The state of New York is also investigating. That's where Donald Trump lived, worked, and ran his campaign. Uh, my former classmate in law school, Tish James, who's the new attorney general, uh, is, certainly, is certainly looking at it, and they're looking at his insurance practices, his tax practices, and his real estate development practices. The other thing I want to say about Mueller, if I may, and uh, I tend to disagree with you here, uh, is that you know Mueller's job was to investigate and reach some conclusions, right? Obstruction, the charge, is one of the few, if not only, uh, charges in the federal criminal code where you don't have to complete the crime. That is, you can attempt to obstruct. And I don't understand how Mueller concludes or is inconclusive on whether whether he even attempted to obstruct because of what Monique said. We know what he said. We didn't have to interview him. He said it on national TV, and he fired Comey. And he can fire Comey to obstruct justice even though he's got a right to do it. So there's more to come on this, and that's really where you're going to see the House focus on the facts in support of that. And perhaps if they get to impeachment, that will be the leading charge for them if they decide to file those articles of impeachment. This is being framed now. now the, the- uh, so, Robert, I'll start with you. Again, all these people saying what the Mueller report says, in the Barr letter, he paraphrased, no complete sentences, paragraphs, we don't know what the hell Robert Mueller said. We have Bob Barr's interpretation of what Robert Mueller said. Well, it's unlike we're ever going to see the full report, uh, primarily because it will be improper to uncharged individuals to have all their information and all the uh, facts and circumstances leaked to the public or sent to the public. Why? Well, uh, let's say you're just some dude who works at Trump Tower. And you were interviewed by Robert Mueller, and now they put all of your information out there to the public. You had nothing to do with it. it you weren't charged. Oh, 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 oh. When you say all your information, you mean pro- private information? Private information. Like your incorrect. address and phone number? Or, it can be redacted. Or, or, or even things that were uh, gained during the investigation that could be hurtful or harmful or embarrassing. You weren't charged as a criminal. You haven't done anything criminally wrong. So why should this information about you be made public? So a summary can be made oh, public. Please. We'll see portions <laughs> of the of the redacted uh, report made public. We're never going to see the entire thing. By I do think for a lot of people in the media who have turned this into the biggest story on earth, most voters don't care. Most people do not walk around every day worrying about what Robert. No, 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 no. Hold up. See this? No, 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 no. See right there. Hold up. This is the mistake that we make when we say when I hear most voters don't care. People aren't walking around every day talking about this here. No, I do believe fundamentally, as a country, it is critically important to get to the truth as to whether or not you had uh, a presidential campaign colluding with a foreign entity to impact a presidential election. Uh, That is, so remember, the president of the United States, when that person is sworn in, uh, they are sworn in to uphold and protect the Constitution against enemies foreign or domestic. And so, uh, so it's not a question of, well, folks walking around. First of all, people walking around every day are worrying about all kinds of stuff. I could apply that to nearly everything. There's no one thing that every voter or majority of people are just worried about every single day, 
but it still is an issue. It is an issue, Roland, and the thing about it is, as you said, I mean, you open a show up absolutely correctly. We, no one has seen this report. So the fact that Barr has summarized 800 pages into four suggests that there's a whole lot of stuff. You know, they say the devil is in the details, and you tell the devil is there with this. But from 800 pages of four, it represents like giving us 2%. 2% of what's out there and his interpretation of the 2%. So I, you know, people may not be thinking, this is not top of mind for everybody, but it is on their mind because what we know is that our democracy has been compromised. We know that there was collusion. Uh, you, you say, someone's going to say it, there isn't, but the man said it himself on television. Um, and Scott and Monique are absolutely right in terms of talking about the fact that Mueller has probably pushed this things downstream to the southern uh, New York district. But here's the thing. I, I'm concerned that there was some interference because um, it seems to me that Barr could have made, uh, not Barr, I'm sorry, Mueller could have made more conclusive uh, statements. And maybe he did and we just haven't seen it. Well, here's the deal, Michael. I think what you have here is uh, Mueller, whose job was to go through all of this and essentially hand this over to Congress. The, the thing that people, I still keep, the keep, keep, still keep missing, impeachment is not, and, and this is where the Trump people, for obvious reasons, kept trying to make this out to be a criminal issue. Impeachment is not a criminal issue. It is a political standard. The idea of obstruction of justice, uh, this idea that, well, you can't also, uh, you can't indict a sitting president. Bob Barr weighed in on this. Bob Barr said, before he became attorney general, that there was no case for obstruction of justice. So you have the guy who said before he got in that, oh, there's no, no, there's no obstruction of justice, who has now concluded there's no obstruction of justice. And frankly, Congress can't make their own determination, which is why they're saying, no, 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 you're going to get subpoenaed because we want to know more about this because we're not just going to take your word for it. Well, I, and of course, I also don't buy the argument that you have to protect people that weren't charged. They weren't thinking about that with Hillary Clinton and Benghazi and Hillary Clinton in the email scandal. They put out all every single possible document uh, from that investigation. And want to go back. And want to go back. So <laughs> Lindsey Graham. I don't buy that argument. Also, with the with the president, it seems to me if there was complete uh, exoneration, they'd be like, you know what? Release the whole darn thing. They don't want to release the whole darn thing. No. They, they don't want any breadcrumbs out there. In fact, today, Senator Mitch McConnell blocked Senator Chuck Schumer well, uh, from uh, passing something to say release the whole deal. Remember, the House voted yes. 422 to zero to, zip. to release it. That's right. That includes Republicans. That's right. I wish that, that um, the, uh, Mr. Miller would have put in a sentence saying, related to obstruction, let Congress figure it out. I well, but here's put, the deal, though. And that could be in there. We don't know. I mean, correct. That and and, and, and that, that really is part of the issue, Robert, what we don't know. That the fact that we are being asked to take the word of a oh, Trump person. appointee yeah. who wrote a document before he became attorney general, basically saying this is a waste of time, it shouldn't be done, there's no obstruction. That's essentially making your mind up before you actually got to be the referee for a game. <laughs> but but th this is the issue. We say we need to find out what the facts are. Robert Mueller's been investigating for two and a half years. Right. We spent $35 million, 19 lawyers, hundreds of FBI agents, thousands of pages of documents. If that hasn't turned up the obstruction and the collusion that people are looking for, what no, no, else no. are we... No, no, what no, else no, 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 wait, no, no, wait, 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 but here's the problem, though. Here's the problem, though. Mueller did not make an opinion on obstruction, okay? His task was not specifically... Uh, just obstruction. First of all, there are a number of people who he did get indictments from. Also, a number of people also convicted. The other issue that you have to raise is they asked the judge to de delay the sentencing of Rick Gates until May. How do you stop an investigation and a sentencing for somebody is still two months away? There has to be a reason why you want a delay of a sentencing that says you still have some work to do. That makes no sense. Well, none of this makes sense, Roland. I mean, the fact is that Mueller has a reputation of being a Boy Scout, um, down with the truth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what he's reported, we don't know. We can speculate, but we don't know. We have these little four flimsy pages that have come from a Trump partisan who right. basically auditioned for his job with that memo audition for his job, put it out there. I don't think the president should have to face any consequences. So 
It doesn't make any sense, but I'm confident that Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats will continue to chip away at getting this whole report out well, to the public. Well, again, bottom line is we have not seen the Mueller report. We've seen Bob Barr's interpretation of it. So that's sort of what we have here. All right, folks, Stacey Abrams of Georgia is a new project aimed at getting an accurate census count in 2020. The new project is called Fair Count and wants to make sure that minorities, non-English speakers, and renters will be counted. Why does that matter? Well, the U.S. Census determines each state's voting power and each state's share of the nearly $1 trillion spent annually on health care, education, and other public services. All right, folks, we'll go to a break, and we'll be back on Roller Martin Unfiltered. You can't win unless you learn how to lose. Basketball star Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Huh? What the hell is that? All right, folks, HBCU Giving Day, Flanders Smith College is our pick today, founded in 1877, located in Little Rock, Arkansas. Of course, his president is an alpha man. Uh, notable graduates include the U.S. Surgeon General, Jocelyn Elders, James H. Cohn, Lottie Shackelford, Stephanie Flowers, and many more. If you want to support Philander, go to philander.edu, philander.edu. That's P-H-I-L-A-N-D-E-R dot E-D-U. Now, certainly a, a good time when I was their commencement speaker uh, where I received the Ozell Sutton Award as well. And so uh, the same day, Jocelyn Elders got the same award. And so uh, glad to uh, be there. And also Ray J is actually going to college there. That's one of the HP, that's where he chose to go. And so we're supposed to have him and the president on the show soon. All right, folks, calling all HBCU alumni, students and leaders, enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge and win $25,000 for your school. Building on their long-term support of HBCUs, Ford is looking to improve mobility in HBCU communities through innovative solutions. The winning program will receive a grant of up to $25,000 to implement their proposal the deadline to apply is March 31st, 2019. Go to fgb.life. That's F right there, right there. fgb.life for more information and to apply. Ford goes further in our community. We certainly thank Ford for being a partner of Roland Martin Unfiltered. No charcoal grills are allowed. I'm white. I got you, Carl. On my property. Whoa! Hey! 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 Black folks really don't like to hear <laughs> about picking cotton. Just want to let y'all know that. Now, cotton picking on slave labor camps, also called plantations, uh, pretty much wasn't funny. Was it funny then? Not funny now, but got these white boys in a frat at the University of Georgia. Oh, they thought this was a laughing matter. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah, him I'm to pick the cotton. <laughs> yeah. Pick my cotton, bitch. I'm not black. <laughs> Wait, pick what, what? my cotton, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> pick my cotton, bitch. Pick my cotton, bitch. Well, you're not using the right words. Pick my <laughs> Wait, get a video of it. Pick my cotton, nigger. <laughs> well, the four frat boys used to be frat boys. They were expelled by Tau Kappa Epsilon. The chapter is also being suspended. The university condemned the action, but so far, those idiots are still in school. I, I, yeah. I'm just saying. I, I mean, there should be zero tolerance for this nonsense. First of all, who is their mama and daddy? Who is their mama and daddy? Who sent them to school to think that they were supposed to do that? That's A. Oh, if, if, if they did it, because that's their mom and daddy probably said uh, that's how they were raised. Like, and, it's all good. But the school should have a zero tolerance for this kind of stuff. This is 2019. <laughs> I mean, come on now. This ain't 1964, anything like this. The school should be ashamed. The president should be ashamed. Student affairs should be ashamed. That's reprehensible. I went to a majority-majority school. And the excuse I guarantee you they use, oh, we were drunk. And that's supposed to be the so excuse. So you can regulate your drink? Uh, of course. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> that excuse is just ridiculous. But that's the excuse. That, of course. Oh, we were drunk. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just having fun. I guarantee you that's what they said. When, in fact, Robert, when you're drunk, actually, 
your real intent actually then, comes out when you drunk. What's it called? Yeah. Liquid yeah. courage. And, 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 liquid <laughs> courage. <laughs> and as a resident of Georgian, on the panel, having gone to plenty of frat parties at EGA, that is par for the course. There's nothing surprising about this. Uh, just the fact that this generation now feels the need to put every dumb thing they do on the internet. But that's the only reason this is coming to light. This is, they've done so worse and far. No, 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 no. no, no. What he's saying is what I agree with. I, I agree. I have great appreciation, white people. I thank you. I thank you for recording this. <laughs> because what y'all have done is provided me a daily segment of crazy as white women and crazy as white men who do crazy stuff. In fact, we have so many videos of crazy as white women and white men. We can't even get to them every single day. We got to spread these suckers out. So I keep saying to all the white people in America, if y'all keep doing racist stuff, I want y'all to record it all. Because every time y'all do one of these and y'all lose your job, we're going to send a group of black people to apply for your job. And so I want y'all to keep doing it because y'all could lend all black unemployment with your crazy asses. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> a previously unknown portrait of Harriet Tubman was unveiled today at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. The founding museum, the founder, director, of, founding director of the museum, Dr. Lonnie Bunch, he did the honors. Uh, and so check it out. Now, the picture is from the 60, it's from the 1860s when Tubman was about uh, 40 years old. Now, the problem, now, most of the photos we see of Harriet Tubman uh, when she was much older and she was frail. This is a very rare photo of Harriet Tubman uh, when she's about 40 years old. If you want to view the photograph and visit the museum, visitors may walk up for entry without a pass Monday through Friday, beginning at 1 p.m. each weekday. That's, of course, a new time. No passes needed after 1 p.m., Monday through Friday, and so we certainly appreciate that. You know, I tell you right now, I, I have been, uh, I've only, I've been to the museum several times. I've only been able to get through about three floors <laughs> because one, because for me as a student of history, I actually enjoy. I mean, I, I take my time, and I'm really taking it in. And with people f wanting selfies and stuff along those lines, you know, you just really just you can't. Uh, and so uh, I, I, ha I need to go back to finish the other seven floors. But it, it, it really is uh, amazing when you look at the artifacts that are in there, mm -hmm. but also the things that you just didn't know. You know, there, the economic history that's enshrined there is fascinating around the all black towns. I mean, I thought I knew black economic history. And when you go down those lower floors, you just keep, keep getting hit upside the head. One of my sisters came to DC and uh, when they had the the time passes. She said, give me a pass for every day. And literally, she went to the museum like it was her job. <laughs> <laughs> she went 10 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock, she's leaving the house. She was in line. And every day, she was there all day. So I think she finally got it all. But one day, she came back, and she's like, don't talk to me. I said, what do you mean, don't talk to you? You living in my house. But, <laughs> but basically, the, the emotion was just so overcome. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I lost it at, at Emmett Till's casket. I yep. lost it. I mean, I literally lost it. I just slid down to the floor and cried. Just the, the power of it. Everybody needs to see it, Roland. I mean, it, it is the most visited uh, it, it, since it's open. It's the most visited Smithsonian Museum uh, in the nation's capital. It's so important. It's so important for our people to understand that history. And it's so important for these ignorant uh, white people, you lift them up every now and then, to see something like this. Lock them in there overnight. You know, Michael. I, it's incredible. I'm like you, Roland. I've been, I don't know how many times I've been, but I, and I, you can't see everything. I don't care how many times you go. And I, I took a... Uh, took my niece and a couple of her friends and it I saw something interesting we start I think you need to start chronologically you need yeah, to start, start all on the way bottom way. go to the bottom and then yeah. come up and they their concept of our people seemed to start at Martin Luther King yes. they don't seem to have that con linear, conceptually yeah. before that yeah and so I found so I said well no we're gonna stay down here a little longer I mean, they clearly know the word slavery, know what it means, but there's no, it's the Dr. King world. Yeah, and, and it's primarily because of how our schools have uh, treated black right. history as if it somehow just starts there. And, but also, the reality is, our history also goes before 1619 as well. Go before, I'm sorry, before, real quick, on the Harry Tubman thing, are they going to use that picture now on the 20? Or they're going to stick with the old. Uh, of course, as, as long well, Trump, 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 Trump
as long as you have a love of white supremacy, it's not a lot of white supremacy right. sitting in the Oval it's Office, trust me, that's not going to happen. Right. Uh, because remember, uh, his favorite president was Andrew Jackson, uh, of course, uh, who was not a fan of black people or Native Americans at all. So, Robert. Well, I think the importance of this is understanding that we have a more complex and layered history than what's often taught to us in school. Where, uh, similar to what you say, you know, I call it the black history fairy tale, where they say, well, you know, Rosa Parks and Abraham Lincoln met together with Dr. King one day, and then Barack <laughs> Obama was president. Um, and that's where they teach yeah, our kids. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's where <laughs> they teach our kids our history. So having floor after floor, exhibit after exhibit, I think it's be mandatory right, for your summer vacation to take, take a drop by and read these things, see these things. And uh, I had an aunt who was born in 1888, died in 1996, grew up with her, and she could show us pictures of people who were slaves. She could talk, so it's writing right. of people who were, it made it all real to us. It wasn't roots, it wasn't television, it wasn't this disambiguous dark term of slavery. Yep. These were human beings. The thing Harriet Tubman in her 40s is a young, dynamic woman, understanding the humanity in her eyes and what it took for her to fight, fight through those consequences. I think it can inspire this generation, as we were talking about earlier with the young people and actors, to know your fight goes on. And I want to say this here, uh, and only because, you know, it's one of those things that most people don't know, uh, and that is uh, when uh, uh, the funding was approved for this uh, museum, Republicans were in control of the House. And they were going back and forth, and initially, uh, then Congressman J.C. Watts, his name was on the bill. And they were going back and forth, and uh, Democrats said, no, we want John Lewis's name on the bill. And, rep and white Republicans were adamant, no, 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 we're going to have J.C. Watts. J.C. Watts took his name off. Hmm. And J.C. Watts said, the museum is more important than me having my name on it. Put Congressman John Lewis's name on the bill. And that's how the, the bill went through. Uh, and I, it, it's just important for us to under... That's just a little small point that, again, uh, that could have that could have got hung up. The money could have got... The initial money could have got hung up if his ego had gotten in the way. But he simply said, no, the museum is more important. Than that, fine, take my name off, put Congressman Lewis's name that's on, a, let's move forward. That's such a great example of some of the bipartisanship that some of the black Republicans will exhibit from time to time. Not consistently, but from time to time. Tim Scott, uh, the, you know, South Carolina, from time to time will step up. Well, but which is also why I keep, I keep telling black people, look, the reality is you have places where, look, Republicans were in control of the House and the Senate. You better know somebody on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I would rather be able to know a J.C. Watts then or Gary Franks or Will Hurd or Tim Scott. You might disagree on nine out of ten things, but you may have that one thing you, you do agree with. But I'd rather have somebody on the other side who I can at least talk to, mm -hmm. yeah. who, who know a little something about uh, what I go through, than somebody who's like, I don't know what the hell you're even talking about. So, uh, hey, folks, tonight, uh, the History Channel, uh, they have a, a documentary called Jesus, His Life. Uh, and I'll be one of the folks who's going to be tweeting uh, throughout the first two hours uh, of that particular documentary. Uh, and so I'll be joining, uh, of course, my man Joshua Dubois and others as well. And so episode one is called Joseph the Nativity. And the second one is John the Baptist, the Mission. And so I'll be live tweeting that. Check out the History Channel, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, so less than an hour. So I'll see you guys uh, in just a little bit. All right, folks, we got to go. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you who saw the Lisa Ray interview we did on Friday. First of all, it was great. And if you haven't seen it, go to our YouTube channel to check it out. Also, please don't forget, you can join our Facebook page, YouTube channel, as well as Periscope. Uh, turn on your live notifications on. Every time we go live, you actually see us. And last thing, if you missed, okay, we only showed you a little bit of the video there. And I thought we were going to actually have more of a sound bite from Lonnie Bunch, uh, but we didn't have it there. If you want to actually hear the program and Lonnie Bunch talk about this photo, go to our YouTube channel. We actually live stream earlier the unveiling of that, that portrait. Why is that important? Look. There's only one show like this in America. It's a whole bunch of people who are sitting behind microphones chatting about what other people do. We actually cover the news. Uh, we actually have covered the Amber Evans uh, case. Uh, we had her mother on the show. You saw Jeffrey, Jeffrey Gardier talking about black activists uh, needing to have self-care. You see us talking about the Florida bill. That's why what we do what we do. We need you to support us as well. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give on uh, our fan club, whether you give monthly, whether you give yearly, go to support this show. Thursday and Friday, we'll be in L.A. 
for the NAACP Image Awards, uh, live from there as well. That's why this show is important for us to speak to our issues. Please go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. I totally appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Cash out, Square, as well as PayPal. Always you can give. All right, folks, y'all have an absolute great day. I got to go. Rocking my Astros. Holla! You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play.